Hello, this is Carl Ackerman, host of Journeys of the Mind, and we are very lucky today uh, to have Professor Maya Sotoro Ng with us today from the Matanaga Peace Center at the University of Hawaii, and also a co-founder of the SEEDS um, nonprofit, which is also dedicated to peace. Um, before we get into uh, all of the um, many um, ingredients um, that you have formulated, um, Maya, to uh, formulate the um, Peace Institute and also to formulate seeds. Tell us a little bit about you. How, what is your journey, not only journey of the mind, but your specific journey um, from growing up and um, and then uh, coming to Hawaii and, and uh, enjoying life and being a professor at the University of Hawaii? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Thank you so much for having me, first of all. And I look forward to the conversation and um, appreciate uh, the community building that you're doing. Um, I was born in Indonesia in on the island of Java. That's my father's land. And I grew up there in a syncretic and bountiful place with so many different textures and flavors and sounds. And uh, I really appreciated that Sultan Haman Kubono was a Muslim, but would also give offerings to Nyai Loro Kidul, the goddess of the South Seas, and how Christians and Hindu and Buddhists and uh, Islamic uh, influences and Kajawin, which is the indigenous um, practices of the place, uh, all kind of work together in mutual support, braided to offer gorgeous uh, shadow puppetry and amazing temples and uh, communities of compassionate care. But I also experienced some very challenging moments in Indonesia. The Chinese, um, who were there for generations, were regarded uh, by the Malay um, often as being more privileged, uh, wealthier, and because there was often a difference in religious practices, um, they were sort of scapegoated in the presence of misery and and struggle. And so the beautiful neighbors around me in Samara, who used to give me sugar cane and talk to me as I walked to go collect my stamps when I was seven, eight, and nine years old, ended up being part of a crowd that threw stones into Chinese shop owners' windows and pulled a Chinese man out of a car and set it on fire. So I recognize that in the complexity of that land, of that space and community, there were opportunities to recognize the heights to which we can rise as a species, but also um, there had to be an understanding of the depths to which we can plunge. And that necessitated, I realized later, a multifaceted view of the human condition, but also a commitment to lift up the very best in um, our natures and to guard against and be vigilant against the worst. And so I realized um, that uh, peace takes practice. And I did not really come to my work as a peace educator until New York City. I was a public school teacher on the Lower East Side of Manhattan at an alternative public middle school called The Learning Project that had a beautiful connection every Wednesday and service projects with uh, the community. And we participated in a, a lots and lots project to convert a abandoned lot into a community garden. And uh, this was a school where students would stand up and kind of do Quaker style morning meetings where they gave each other shout outs, but also told stories about what they were doing in class and experiencing outside and asked questions uh, about um, the things that uh, worried them and opened up spaces of reflection and dialogue. So it was a very thoughtful school in so many ways. And it really formed my standard for school community engagement and an education that is meaningful, I understood then, was one that was connected, that built those bridges, that didn't work within the silos of um, and constraints of the four walls of the school. And so 
we spent a lot of time in those years taking the students out to the Isamu Noguchi Museum or the Museo del Barrio or the New Yorican Poet Society or um, the time or the New York Historical Society, places where they could learn stories beyond the 10 block radius where the school and many of the families resided. Um, and then when I came to Hawaii to look after my tutu, my grandmother, um, in 2000, I took with me um, the, the mandates and community vision of those years of teaching. And I started working at the UH Lab School. And I realized that when they invited me to teach multicultural education at the College of Education, where I was getting my PhD, that for me, multicultural education is peace education. And peace education is about really seeing truth and and Juliana from multiple perspectives and um, knowing one another's stories and braiding those stories together, call them sort of like banyan tree oral histories or um, finding ways to do structured academic controversies where we tell one, uh, we speak to one side or debate one side and then flip and use poetry or pulpit speech or journal entry or letter to argue the opposite empathetically um, of what we just argued and then find a way to merge uh, or to draw from more than one side as we identify our truth. So for me, peace education was an opportunity to um, think about, you know, our deepest um, humanity and the various tools of nonviolent communication and conflict transformation um, and pragmatic um, recognition of each other's rights and responsibilities. It was also um, an opportunity to think about our hybridities and our collisions. So multicultural education, I saw it, was so often taught as um, you know, kind of bounded and like cultures never change, that they were finite. And so they would do the food court or the holiday, and there would be, for instance, a uh, study of kimono or eating sushi, and as though that were enough to understand Japanese culture and to navigate through those cultural spaces and potential um, uh, uh, conflicts. And I saw that it wasn't enough. So rather than kind of looking at culture as fixed, I saw let's really have a constructivist approach and try to um, layer in um, other perspectives into our own. And, and so I worked at the College of Ed for a number of years and I turned um, my commitments to into a peace education course at the lab school as well as the College of Education. And then it was cross-listed with the Matsunaga Institute for Peace and Conflict Resolution at the University of Hawaii uh, College of Social Sciences across the street. And so I was ultimately recruited to go over there where I've been teaching peace education and conflict management and um, leadership for social change, but where you really see peace defined very broadly is, of course, nonviolent political alternatives and restorative justice and personal peace and indigenous peace and environmental justice and uh, peace movements and negotiation and mediation and uh, protest under occupation and so forth. And so we really see peace as um, something that every discipline and every student should be thinking about. That's, you know, you segued from your background into, you know, all the questions that I was going to ask about, about how you got into this peace initiative. So now I'm going to um, throw some more, uh, a little bit more difficult questions at you. And with, you know, Putin's war against the Ukraine, and of course, with, you know, Hamas's horrific, um, uh, you know, uh, capture and killing of Israelis. And I, I may add that, you know, it's interesting that you, with your background, um, you know, labeled the, you know, the 
people of, of Chinese and ancestry in Indonesia as sort of very similar to the Jewish issue in Europe. And um, um, so that's really wonderful and that you have um, relationships with the wonderful culture of, of Islam. And um, let me ask you this question. Actually, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a two-pronged uh, question. One is, when you're teaching peace and you have to deal with the Russian incursion into Ukraine, which you know seems pretty one-sided um, in terms of who is causing the violence, how do you deal with it? And coupled with that is, I was really profoundly moved, and um, my horror of the the um, you know Israeli Hamas war came to um, fruition. Um, when I saw as an outcome of this, these three Palestinian students in Vermont who were shot on the street, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, I looked at these young men and I thought that they could be me. I mean, they looked like me when I was their age. And I thought, oh my God. So the, the two pronged questions are, how do you deal with peace resolution um, by uh, uh, Professor Ng, um when you have such an aggressor as Vladimir Putin? And second of all, what do you say to your students when they see what happened to these three very innocent, um, uh, you know, and, and you know, uh, politically motivated, of course, because they were identifying with the Palestinian cause. They're Palestinian. This is normal. Um, and uh, how do you how do you deal with this in your class? Well, I do sort of three things. One is I. I do make room for different opinions. Now, this doesn't mean that um, I always give space for um, dialogue about every conflict that arises um, in the classroom. Sometimes, although I believe in sustained dialogue and having difficult conversations, there is also a lot of risk uh, that some voices will get louder, that the commitments to nonviolent communication will get derailed, that some people will not feel safe, right? So a lot of what I do is I will create a um, resource list, which I did for, for instance, Israel and Palestine, and for me personally, um, my focus is on restorative narrative. So it's important to recognize the violence, but my focus is on our solutionary capacity. So the resource list contains all sorts of resources for peace and justice organizations um, for, for both sides um, and for relief organizations. Um, for the region, for educational resources and curriculum that in the case of Israel and Palestine is about sharing the perspectives of, of both sides um, to develop critical thinking and, and you know, foster inclusivity and create um, uh, an understanding that goes beyond received stories. Um, and then also media store uh, resources, you know, how, what media can be trusted? Um, how can we uh, see um, the truth from both perspectives simultaneously and make room for that? How can we, again, find stories of people who are demonstrating great courage and generosity in the midst of the suffering? And so I share those resources and we work with them, not so much in kind of open dialogue because that's really more for venting frustrations and fears, but we work with them in very targeted ways um, as we share the uh, voices um, of the people who are at the front lines and suffering the most. We think about how they are not capable so much of um, empathy right now. They're in the survival mode. They're just trying to move forward and asking them to find empathy right now is perhaps too much, but it is then the responsibility of the rest of us to continue to try to understand um, 
those lives, those experiences, to look at the suffering, but also try to see within that the beauty, the possibility, and the solutions to try to avoid um, Islamophobia and, um, but, you know, I mean, the the Palestinian um, folks who were targeted, right, um, uh, are are not the only ones, right? So we we have to um, also ensure that because there are a lot of people who are targeting um, Jewish folks as well. Um, so we have to avoid uh, degrading into violence holding that vigilance and creating an ongoing space of possibility that is not just about tolerance, but also um, courageous understanding. And then the second thing I do, in addition to trying to um, get folks to both recognize and respect and feel compassion for those distant others. Or I try to find ways to get my students to be able to support in some small way. Peace action takes many forms. Some of that is um, ensuring that um, there are voices that have not been heard that are brought into the center. Um, Part of it, uh, action may be organizing a fundraiser. Part of it may just may be um, uh, becoming educated on humanitarian efforts, uh, thinking about compassion through action, through volunteering in our local communities and how the ripples of action might extend um, outward, um, learning about um, uh, you know, organizations like hands of peace and hand in hand and um and the numerous others that are um trying to empower young people from israel and palestine and the u.s to engage in ongoing dialogue um the the failures of um of education in other words and understanding are not just there um, in Israel and Palestine, you know, they're, they're also within our schools and communities. So in addition to taking action, which helps folks get unstuck and makes them feel somewhat empowered, um, at the very least to, um, to set down fear and to try to lead with love um, and, and, you know, building out their educational capacity and understanding of this deeply rooted multi-generational conflict. The third thing I try to do is to um, help find antidotes to grief for uh, students who are um, feeling frightened and frustrated and angry. And no, uh, we, the Peace Institute, can't necessarily um, be, be therapists and we're ill-equipped to, you know, to take away all anxiety, but certainly personal peace and um, reflection and uh, connection with our humanity and the understanding that conflicts can not always be resolved, but they can always be transformed, to use the words of John Paul Lederach, you know, to keep uh, hope enlivened um, about the, the goodness of the world, you know. So um, a lot of that involves um, reflection you braiding in um, the lives of distant different others with their own, uh, thinking about um, uh, compassion in their own lives, looking at their rivers of life and thinking about resilience uh, and, you know, crafting um, a story of self that helps them to be upstanders and leaders. So those are the things that I do in my limited capacities as a as a peace educator, but you know there are many things that all of us can do, including you, and in, in sharing uh, stories and resources. And um, so, my hope is that everyone can come to see themselves as peace builders. It's about positive peace, 
um, not negative peace. Negative peace is the absence of acute conflict. That's important, but it's not enough. Positive peace is the presence and participation of all of us. We enter the stream wherever we can, and we contribute whatever resources and understanding that we can. And, um, and my hope is that everyone who's watching this and everyone who comes through our Matsunaga Institute and Seeds of Peace um, feels an increased sense of capacity to do positive peace building work. Well, you know, I, I was struck um, by um, many of the, well, the, all of the three things that you mentioned were kind of um, used by Jake Tapper the other day with um, people who had relatives who were captured by Hamas and were hostages. And, and the, the, I was really dumbfounded by the response of the relatives because they said that, you know, all they're after is getting the hostages back. There's nothing more. And, it, you know, they just want their family and loved ones back. So they, they kind of put to aside the brutality and the atrocities of Hamas and um, was, were just focusing on um, that single issue, which brings up my last question to you because you were a peace expert. So we have a president now, Joe Biden, who um, clearly um, stated that uh, you know, his position is uh, to support um, um, the IDF and the Israeli forces. But in so doing, he has tremendous influence in calming things down a bit, um, which I think that he is playing every day with his cards. So this was something that was, um, you know, first, the first time I saw it was with George Bush Sr. when he went to China and he was trying to, you know, having been an ambassador there, allay a lot of the issues and people sometimes would criticize him with dealing with um, the PRC. But his response was, you know, if you set up the dialogue, it's better. So here's my question to you. So, you know, it, it, from your perspective, from a peace perspective, um, is uh, President Biden on the right track in a sense, not in terms of his positions one way or the other versus Israel and uh, the Palestinians, um, but um, in trying to go behind the scenes and influence people kind of, you know, in a way that um, no other people, no other person in the world could do it. So it's a tough question. And um, well, and, and I hope you don't feel like I'm sidestepping it when I say, look, all of it is needed. You know, I am not in a position to, you know, render judgment as I see it on the commander in chief, you know, I'm coming at the work and the conflict from a ground up teacher, community members, vantage point, and there are considerations that I have and things that are important to me that are not the same as the priorities that he has to hold close, right? So what I will say is, you know, he, uh, is aligned with um, Israel and, you know, is also doing work beyond his public self to, to, you know, behind the scenes, as you say. And then it's important that the people, you know, created a lot of protest movements and you know, showed um, support for Palestine, you know, in the sense that I think that all of it is needed to remind us that what Hamas did was despicable um, and that the suffering of the Gazan um, people is unacceptable, right? So anything for me that is in the service of like trying to find peace and that must include sustained dialogue. But, you know, anger is also important and protest is important. We should, we can move beyond it. Um, but Sometimes that's so much better than being paralyzed by inequality, frustration, and exploitation and a sense of injustice, right? Let's let's move forward. So we respect and honor the messages, all of them that come through with all the people that gathered in support of both um, Israel and Palestine, and we don't get uh, overwhelmed by it. All of us need to practice leaning into our discomfort, allowing in difficult thoughts and emotions being and staying curious and making friends with um with with difference and um knowing that within this conflict 
uh, there there are opportunities at various stages to transform and to learn to grow, to be better, to be more just, so that we're not sitting simply in our s sadness and frustration and vulnerability. Um, Valerie Carr, who's a Sikh uh, writer who who um, started speaking after the bombing of the Sikh temple, um, she said um, that the, there, these are dark days. There are fires here in abundance, but what if the darkness is of the womb, not the tomb? Um, you know, so the midwives would tell us to breathe and push. And I don't say that what is happening in the world to Ukraine, you know, in Israel and Gaza, it's not that that's good. No, but um, we can meet the destructive with constructive. We can show revolutionary love. We can grieve and work and not just fight with people, but also build with people and and listen to newly reimagined solutions. And so I want us not to despair. I want us to look at you know what a conflict this challenging. You don't just have one solution or strategy. Everyone brings what they can, and um, everyone should care um, because that's how we stay both you know humane and and. Um, relevant as individuals, as leaders, and as citizens. Well, that, you know, that was a wonderful answer. And um, I didn't think you sidestepped that at all. I mean, I think you were cognizant of the difficult position that any president is in. And um, you wanted to make commentary that it would elucidate, you know, your various issues. So I, I don't think you did. So we have about a minute left. So here's my, here's my question for you um, in the minute left. Um, and that is, your institute seems to be, you know, somewhat better situated um, at the University of Hawaii um, uh, for a Geneva-like expose, meaning why not Hawaii as the peace center of the world? Have you given thought to that and, you know, have people who have conflict come to Hawaii, enjoy the life here and work at peace? Yeah, we have thought of that. And of course, it's my aspiration and hope but it's a small department with limited resources and those are the struggles that we're all confronted many of us are confronted with you know good ideas extraordinary opportunities but challenges of resources so you know we um we do our best with what we have um to inspire a vision of not just hawaii but the the, the region uh, as a place of bridge building, of navigational spirit, you know, connecting island peoples and um, people on the continent with uh, a sense of um, restorative potential and the beauty of this extraordinary place and space. Um, I think that uh, it would be wonderful if at some point, we could build what we imagine uh, more fully. And um, yes, I, I uh, am very open if you have an angel investor who would like to, <laughs> who would like to um, heap resources into that vision. <laughs> well, thank you. And, you know, it has been such a pleasure. I want to thank Professor Maya Satoru Ng um, for being our guest today in Journeys of the Mind. And, you know, it's always wonderful to have a majestic and erudite person um, come and talk with us. So oh. this is Carl Ackerman, Journeys of the Mind. Uh, Maya, I'll leave any last comments for you. I want to leave you just to let you know, uh, um, a uh, 20 seconds or so to just conclude yourself. No, I just want to thank you again. These conversations activate a sense of possibility um, and maybe in young people or uh, people who might not have thought of themselves as part of the equation for building peace. So I'm grateful um, that you are leading these conversations. Thank you.